Hey folks, welcome back to another Forever Employable Story. I'm really, really excited for this episode as I get to speak with software developer and community leader, Danny Thompson, all the way from Memphis, Tennessee, which is a place I've never been, but I've heard amazing things about. Danny, so much, thanks so much for uh, joining us today on Forever Employable Stories. Thank you for having me, Jeff. You know, I genuinely appreciate this. I'm excited to be here and I can't believe that I'm getting to talk to you. So I'm kind of elated about that. Amazing. Well, it's, it's, uh, the, fe the feeling's mutual. Listen, I, one of the things, and we're talking about this before I hit record, is I've been doing a few of these forever employable stories, looking for people who are building a platform around their core competency or their, their, their core discipline, the thing that, like you're a software developer, right? And, and one of the things I, I discovered you on Twitter a few months ago, and I've been following and paying attention, and as I've been doing that, I've noticed time and time again, in many ways, you embodying a lot of the ideas and the tactics that I talk about in Forever Employable, creating this uh, much more than just kind of a software development resume around yourself, but like you said, a community around yourself as well. And we're gonna get into the details of why and how you're doing that. And I'm super excited to hear your story, but let's start first. Um, um, Give us like kind of the, you know, the, the summary of, of how you got into software development in the first place, kind of what happened before that, because I think that's super interesting and what, what made you shift into tech and, and kind of where, where you are uh, today. Just a bit of a history. Sure. So for those that don't know, I'm Danny Thompson and my background is I worked in gas stations for over 10 years and I was a professional chicken fryer, you know, I could fry chicken with the best of them. And that's what I did. And that's pretty much where I thought I was going to live the, the rest of my days doing. And I was at the age of 30, where I was found myself at a fork in the road. And I said, Okay, if I go right, I'm going to work in this gas station until the day I die. Or I can go left. And I will change whatever I'm doing, but it has to be now. Now is a very important time for me. My son was growing at that age. I, I realized I wouldn't have the luxuries I have now to try and change something. So it needs to be now. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. And mm -hmm. at that time, I was working like 80 hour weeks. My wife was extremely supportive of what we were doing. But it, of course, it was tough. And I was making just enough money to be broke. I was making just enough money to look at my paycheck and just be disappointed with what I was doing. And I was working 80 hours a week and I still said, man, I need to pick up a second job or a third job or a fourth job. Like it, it was that bad. So it was at this time where I saw an interview, a rapper was giving an interview. Uh, he invested several million dollars into a tech company and he was asked why. And he said, well, I'm learning how to code. Now this blew my mind because I never knew someone from my background, from my neighborhood could ever learn something like learning how to code. My preconceived notion was tech was for the rocket scientists and the PhDs of the world. No average individual works in this field. <laughs> and so of course he's learning how to code. And the reasoning was profound. They said, well, you know, you're learning how to code. You're not going to become a developer or something like that. So why are you learning how to code? Why wouldn't you want to know how the amazing machine that you touch 90% out of your day operates? Like, yeah. why is the limit of our understanding opening up YouTube.com on Google Chrome or Internet Explorer and watching cat videos? Like, why don't we know what's happening in the background? Like, why don't I understand why this laptop costs $2,200 or this smartphone costs 1500 bucks? What is RAM? What is Snapdragon? It's all buzzwords until you put something behind it. So he starts learning how to code and so do I. And I get on the internet and I find freecodecamp.org and I start learning how to code and I get on there. And after a little while, I find out about something called meetups. And the meetup is a place where a bunch of developers, they just get together, they talk tech, talk shop, and there are varying levels. So you can obviously get some level of like help or maybe some questions answered, but it's really just the community of developers there. So I find out about the first like meetup that I ever go to. And at this time, I just know like HTML, CSS, and I created a very simple application where you enter the URL of an image 
and it returns that image with like some coloring on top. It's like a really, really bad filter, right? Uh-huh. But it's pretty safe to say at this point in my life, I could cure cancer with code. I'm that good, all right? Like, I, I was terrible. <laughs> but I walk in this meetup and I instantly realize, oh, I don't know anything. Like, I don't know anything. And then I quickly realize, like, all these people are saying, like, foreign languages to me. They're talking about, like, Java and C Sharp and SQL. And it's like, it doesn't make sense. Like, but now I'm hooked. I've just been introduced to this brand new breadth of knowledge that I didn't know existed. And I realized also in that moment that I am being excluded from the conversation. And I said, I will never, basically because of a lack of knowledge, I didn't know anything. I just knew Mm. HTML, CSS. I didn't even know Java. I didn't know none of that. So I said, I will never be excluded again. So I went home and I started learning about JavaScript. Then I started learning about ES6 functions. And I go to that next meetup saying, well, do you know about this in ES6 functions? Do you know how to do arrow function? And then I go home, I start learning more and more and more, more. And I start learning about SQL. And I start learning about SQL tables. And I go to that next uh, meetup and I'm like, well, do you know how to do a SQL query? Do you know how to do this in SQL? Then I start going home more and more and more. And I start learning about Java. And I go to that next meetup. Well, do you know about Spring Framework? Do you know how you do this? And now I'm included in this phenomenal community of developers that are just there to talk about tech and help each other grow. And now I'm in this, I'm included. I've I've brought myself to the team. And it was the best thing that ever happened because it totally changed my trajectory as where I was going because it showed me what was possible and what was not possible. And then I, I did the one thing that every beginner does when they go to a meetup and they ask, how do I get that first job in tech? Uh, How do I get, that first opportunity. And I heard the exact same answer over and over and over like a broken record. It was almost like they recorded it and just pressed play whenever somebody asked this question. And they were like, oh man, that first job, woo, that's the hardest one. But if you get the first one, everything after that will become easy to get later on. To someone like me, that was the worst thing you could ever say to me. Because yeah. not only did you demotivate and demoralize me, you've given me zero action items to work on. You haven't even told me something practical that I can do to increase my odds. Right. And I quickly realized in that same moment that everyone else was asking this exact same question, getting this exact same answer back. And so I, I figured out, like, I need to figure out how to address this. So I immediately started the LinkedIn profile. Mind you, I'm still working in gas stations. They used to call me Popeyes because I'd walk in a meetup. Everybody would start craving chicken because I smell like it, right? I've been cooking it all day. So I walk into this meetup smelling like chicken. And I'm working in the gas station. I start this LinkedIn profile. And I just start cold calling and cold messaging hiring managers and business decision makers and uh, recruiters and managers. And in the beginning, they're like, who is this guy? Why is he messaging me? And now they're like, oh, I knew Danny from the beginning. But it was just that getting out there, I created an entire hiring network. And we went from, I helped the first person get their first job in tech. And I realized that if I can show someone that is trying to learn tech in a different light, that they're passionate, they're going out of their way, they're part of a community, they're helping others, that a hiring manager may be more inclined to return their phone call and ask to meet with them. And Mm -hmm. I'm not a big application guy. I don't like filling out tons and tons of applications. I'd rather leverage my network. So by doing this, I've now helped them basically get to interview number one without filling out an application. Like they, we create this profile for them that is so robust that it just draws attention and interest. So Mm -hmm. I helped that first person get that job in tech and they were crying. They were so happy. Right. And I realized in that moment, Nothing mattered to him more than getting that job in tech, but also making their dream come to life, making exactly what they've been striving for for a year, two years, actually come to life in their hands. It's tangible. Nothing in life mattered more to him than getting that opportunity. And nothing mattered more to me than sharing that moment with him, sharing that joy, sharing that happiness. And I went from helping one person to helping 10 people from 10 to 20, from 20 to 40, 
And now we're at almost 70 people that have helped learn the first jobs in tech. And I don't monetize this. I'm not making money from, I just really enjoy it. Something kind of clicked in me not too long ago. I was obsessed with the idea of always like, I need to make more money. I need to be more successful. I need to reach new levels. And then I realized I'm no longer concerned with trying to become a rich man on my deathbed. What I am concerned with is the impact that I'm going to try and create within that time period and make sure I hit the things that I'm aiming for. And I think this is a really long response to, hey, how you doing, by the way? But, you know, I'm just making <laughs> well, sure we <laughs> cover the bases. Well, it was just, hey, how you doing, tell me your story, which I think you did a great job. <laughs> and look, that's amazing. And the impact that you're having is, and, and now, look, and we're going to talk about how, how tech can make that impact exponential over time. But I'll call, just a couple of clarifying questions. So um, Free Code Camp, just really quick, from, from freecodecamp.org until your first gig, your first tech gig, how long did that take, like time-wise? How much, how much time passed? So I hate answering this question. I will answer, but I hate answering, and I'll tell you why. Especially for beginners, when they hear people's timetable, they're like, oh, man, it took him six months, and I'm at month seven, so I'm just a complete failure. Or it took him a year and a half, and I'm at a year and eight months, so I might as well just quit. I always say it doesn't matter how long it takes you to reach your destination as long as you get there and you keep going for what you want. And a great example I'll give of that is I work with a phenomenal developer. It took him six years to actually land his first job in tech. It took me eight months to answer your question. Mm -hmm. Both of our titles are developers. His title isn't took six years to become a developer developer. It's software developer. So our pay is the same. Our perks are the same. So it doesn't matter how long it takes you to reach your destination as long as you keep striving for that goal. I don't care if it takes you forever. I don't care if it takes you a day, just reach that point. So I hope no one no, gets look, dissuaded it, by the timetable, but it took me eight months. No, no. And, and, and look, the reason I ask, you know, the reason I ask is, is because I want, you know, in, in my, in my experience, achieving these, these sort of career transformations, right. And it, it takes time and it takes consistency and it takes perseverance. I actually, people usually usually err on the other side and they'll say, well, I should be able to take a boot camp in 12 weeks and get a job, right? And it's like, <laughs> well, no, right? That's not what you should expect. You should expect six, eight, 12, 18, 24 months of hard work to, to make the transition to whatever is the next thing for you. If you can get it done in eight months, Congratulations. Well done. But it might take you four, five, six years to get there as well. And it's that perseverance that gets there. So let me ask you another question because this related to this as well. So you're still working at the gas station, 80 hours a week, right? Um, you've, got, you've got a child, you're married. Um, when are you doing this, man? Like when is this stuff happening? The, 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 the teaching yourself the code and, and kind of making, starting to build this foundation for your transition into tech. I'll answer that. I just want to make one point because you said something that I find amazing that software boot camps always advertise things like become a developer in 90 days or, right. or, or, you know, three months. Of, and I think that's insane. Here's a great example. You know, that show 90 day fiance, they can't find the fiance in 90 days. How are they going to find a brand new career that pays them all this in 90 days? Like it's impractical, but uh, yeah. I, I think that's just a way to get people in the door. It, I'm not going to say it's impossible. I'm sure there's some people that have done it, but don't be shocked if it takes you a little bit longer. Uh, yeah. As far as finding the time to learn, honestly, it was tough. It was really, really tough. And mm. what I started doing was I would study as soon as I got home from work, you know, I'd be exhausted. And what I realized my brain wasn't really retaining. It was exhausted from the day I've done all this manual labor. Like my brain is done. Right. And sure. I was like doing the same thing over and over and over and still wasn't retaining. It was taking forever. So finally one day I said, you know what, I'm going to try something. And I started waking up at two 30 in the morning every day. And I started learning. And what I realized is my brain is rested. It's fresh. And it was at absorbing 2:30? everything. You're fresh like at two 30 in the morning. Well, I mean, compared to going <laughs> through, you know, a 14, 15 hour day. But uh, okay. I had no other option. Like, and, I, and, and I tell people this all the time. It's like, I didn't wake up at 2.30 because I thought this was cool. I literally <laughs> didn't have any other choice. It's not like I could be like, okay, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm going to study. I was, I was working. I was 
there was no option at that time. So yeah. I started waking up at 2.30 in the morning, started studying, and I, I'd study until I have to go to work, give me a couple hours there. And then I would, re, like, throughout the whole day, I would be revising in my head everything that I learned. And what I started doing to really test myself is when I'd be on break, I would literally write code on my phone, just in a notepad, no editor or anything like that. And I would right. go try it just to see, like, is this going to work? Is this going to fail? Like, is this going to do something? Just to see if I know my concepts. And it went from, you know, the most basic things to start to elevating slightly, slightly, slightly. And I don't care what craft it is that you do. Once you start putting an obscene amount of hours into it, you're going to get better at it. You may not become like a, a concert pianist, but you can definitely become a piano player. If you put enough hours in there, you can do a couple songs. Same thing with sure. development. You can start writing some code and eventually you're going to get better. You may not work at Google, but you could definitely work at Harry's insurance company down the street, right? So you'll get those basics and you keep growing after that. And that's exactly what I started doing. And I started doing that with um, JavaScript. And then from JavaScript, I started doing with Python. And I spent a lot of time learning Python and I realized, oh, there's no Python jobs in Memphis. Like there's just none. And so I dropped Python and I started picking up Java and that's where the opportunity started coming. And it was fantastic for me. And I'm full stack developer because of that. And I'm very happy with where I am. So, and, and look, and so what I love about this is that, look, this, this is another thing that I think a lot of folks need to realize is that if you're going to start to, to, to transition into the next thing or to build any kind of a, um, either a new expertise or a new platform around you, well, you're already busy, right? Everyone's busy. Everyone either has, you know, they've got work, they've got family, they've got commitments, they've got all these things they do. Um, finding the time for the stuff, fitting the stuff in the cracks is, is, is a key, I'm going to say trick, but it's not a trick. It's, it's, the, it's one of the main ways that you start to build up the momentum for a transition into the next thing, which I, I hear you saying is exactly what you were doing. It's what I did as well as I was transitioning sort of out of full-time employment into consulting, ultimately in doing some writing, everything was happening in the cracks. I was writing, I was commuting to New York City um, on the bus uh, to, you know, to and from 45 minutes, I can write something, 45 minutes there, 45 minutes back, you fit it in and, and then you get it done. Um, and what, that's again- What was that? Oh, yeah. I don't wanna cut you off. No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, what I was gonna say, this goes to a point that I talk about a lot. If you make something a priority, you will find a way to achieve that thing. When you have something that you're thinking about all the time, and like, that's why I don't really believe, and I, I, I get heat for this time to time again, I don't really believe in procrastination. It's just, it's not important to you. If yeah. something is important, if something is a priority, you will achieve it no matter what. Like there are days where I'm like, man, I really don't wanna be at work right now. I don't wanna work today. And I'm still here because it's a priority. I have to do this thing. When my goal, once I realized that there was a way for me in tech, nothing in the universe could have stopped me. This was happening, whether anyone believed it or not. Because I remember when I would tell people like, hey man, I'm thinking about going into tech. They were like, oh, this isn't for people like us. I tell my coworkers this at the gas station. This isn't for people like us. That's for smart people. You're right. It isn't for us but this is for me. This is going mm. to happen whether you believe it or not. This is going, this is my priority. And when, once I made tech a priority, nothing could stop it at that point. It would, I'm getting up at 2.30 whether I want to or not because I have to make this happen. I'm going to learn this concept because I have to make this happen. I need to learn this because I'm going to give myself a better life whether someone wants to give it to me or not. There's 7 billion people on this planet. I'm gonna make one of them fall in love with me and give me a job. Yeah. Simple as that. It's a priority of uh, happen. And, and listen, I mean, and the stuff, and, and if you go through these forever employable stories that are on the blog or in the book, the, the impetus for that prioritization seemingly is always the same, right? I, I've, I've got to take care of my family. I've, I need a better life. I need to future proof my career. I need to, to prove something to myself around, around my capabilities and my skills. And so it's, it, the, the, the specifics are different, but the theme, the theme repeats itself over and over again. This was critical for you. You want to create a better life for yourself. So you prioritized it. And when I hear people, and it's, it's frustrating for me sometimes because there are folks that I've known for years 
who um, have asked me, well, how did you, you know, how did you get started writing books? How did you get started doing that? I said, well, like you, like you just said, I prioritized it. It was important to me. And I know those folks have the skill and I know they've got the expertise to do the same thing, but they don't prioritize it. So they never do it. Right. There's, there's always I love that. that. I love that. I love that. And I'll tell you why I talk about this all the time. You have to have your reason for being your reason for why. And I, if you don't have, if you haven't figured out what your driving force is, you need to have a very honest conversation with yourself. Put away all electronics, put away everything, lock yourself in a room, turn out the light, don't fall asleep, like sit up. And I guarantee you, your mind is going to wander somewhere. And then ask yourself the questions that you don't want to answer. Why am I wanting to do this? Why am I even thinking about this? Everyone thinks this is crazy. Should I even be doing this? Ask mm -hmm. yourself these questions. If you don't have a strong reason for wanting to do something, it's hard because, oh, I want to become a developer because the paycheck is nice. You get a paycheck from anywhere. You get a paycheck from McDonald's. You, get, you can literally get a paycheck from anywhere. Don't, that's not a reason. But is the reason I want to improve my living conditions. Now, that's a reason. I want to take care of my wife and my son. That's a reason. I want to get a house for my mother and my father. That's a reason. I want to change the circumstances to which my life revolves around. I want to stop riding the bus and get in a car. I want to own something. I want to dictate my terms. Now that is a reason that I can get behind. And that will be a reason that gets you out of sleep. I say, I always talk about this. Like you need to make your goals so big that you get excited by them. And I'm a big believer in you can cap your success. If you cap your success, you will hit that cap. Meaning. I'm a big believer in if you say, I want to become a software developer, you will absolutely become a junior software developer. You will actually hit that. You, like if your goal is to become an entry developer, you will absolutely hit that without a shadow of a doubt, but you won't go past that. My goal is never to be an entry developer or a junior developer. My goal is to be the best developer that I could be. I want to be the most valuable developer that I can be. And in doing so, of course, junior and entry are going to come. They're natural stepping stones. I can't be the best without getting the entry position. What happens is yeah. people hit the entry. They get that first taste of what they really wanted. Then they quit. They're satisfied. Mm -hmm. They're no longer hungry. They lost that passion for what they're looking for. And then what happens in six months when they're fired? They can't believe what happened. Right. I knew I was going to become an entry developer. I was promoted within less than three months of getting that position because I showed the value of what I bring to the table. And I'm about to be promoted again because I know what I'm bringing to the table. If you bring value, they will bring a checkbook. It's as simple as that. No, country, no company in the history of the world has turned down an opportunity to make money when you show them actual value. So stop capping your success. Make sure you have your driving force and you will achieve exactly what you want. I love it. If you, if, if you bring value, they'll bring the checkbook. I love it. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, all right, man, let's, let's do a little pivot here because this is really interesting to me now. So, okay, so pivot point in your life, 30 years old, you decide, hey, you know what? I'm going to change my life. Eight months later, you get your first gig. You're doing great. Um, but you don't stop there. I mean, you're, you're, becoming, you're becoming the best developer you can, but you start to build a platform around yourself. You start to not share your knowledge. You start to, you start to tweet you start to write, you start to make YouTube videos, you start to put on, to put together uh, in-person groups, virtual groups. Why? It's a lot of work, man. You got a lot going on as it is, 100%, right? 100%, yeah. why, why, lot, why do that? So I'm a big believer in if I walk in a room, I need to make an impact. Simple as that. I need to mm -hmm. make sure that when I walk out, someone knows my name. And it's because you never know where one conversation can take you. I can't tell you, I'm, I'm literally working on a deal right now with a local government that is an hour away from me. And it is because I had one conversation with one, strain, with one stranger at one event in December. And that conversation lived on for six months that in June they contacted me because of that conversation. You never know where one conversation will take you. And for me, I'm, and I was anti-social media for the longest. The only thing I had was a LinkedIn profile. Yeah, and I would, yeah. Well, so Twitter, yeah, Twitter so I was on strong. LinkedIn. Well, Twitter only started in March. Uh, it's only been what, five months? Five months, six so, months? Yeah, yeah. Jeez. So, uh, it, it's, it's definitely been grown a lot. 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I, I talk a lot about how to grow on Twitter and um, I, I give a lot of advice on that, but 
for me, I was only on LinkedIn because I said, this is where the opportunities are to help people grow. I didn't care about the rest. It wasn't until someone showed me that there's all these tech professionals on Twitter discussing ideas and things like that, that I was like, oh, I'm really gravitating towards this. And then I realized like I can be my true self on Twitter, talking about the things that I think about all the time. And what I ended up doing with Twitter is, and I approach Twitter completely different than others. I don't make tweets for people. I've created this fictitious being in my head that I'm having a one-way conversation with, that my goal is to help them along their path. And kind of, it's really, I'm talking to myself that I, where I was in that learning journey where I was at a beginning. Your younger self, yeah, and yeah. Pretty much, and I'm, I'm giving myself the advice that I was looking for that I didn't know about and that I was hoping someone at a higher level would tell me. And uh, people gravitate towards it, and I'm glad they enjoy it. Sometimes I get it wrong, and that's completely fine. I'm human, I make mistakes. But when I get it wrong, that's great. It wasn't really meant for you either. I'm talking to this fictitious being. If you like it, I'm glad that you're enjoying it and you're along for the ride. And if you don't yeah. like it, you don't have to necessarily show favoritism to that. But I always say you're the boss, you're the CEO of your feed. You can hire and fire accordingly. If you don't like something, get rid of it and keep that negativity away from you. Keep your mental health and your mind exactly where you want it. So if your goal is, I want to become a writer on this XYZ subject, surround your feed with writers of that subject and you will get ideas, you'll get inspiration, you'll figure out some things. I'm not saying plagiarize, don't do that, but get inspired and you can actually utilize the inspiration of whatever you're doing. So that is exactly what I do with Twitter. And the reason for that, and I talk about this all the time, Twitter is great for like, random instances of great opportunities, but LinkedIn is really where the money is and where companies are. And so I use LinkedIn for helping people get jobs because obviously that's where it is, but Twitter is fantastic for opportunities. And that's the reason why my platform has grown so much as of now. A lot, a lot of folks ask me, um, especially after they've, they've read the book or, or something that they say, well, okay. Um, what, who, who do I write? Like, what do I write about? What should I talk about? And, and one of the things that, that I do, my background is, is design and, and user experience and design. And so the, I always kind of fall back to that training. I say, great, well, who's your, who's your target audience, right? Who's your persona? Who's your reader persona? And, and having a reader persona be your younger self is such a brilliant um, theme to, to, to kind of thread through a, a social media presence uh that I, I absolutely love it I, I, as, I, as you were talking about it, i was like this big smile just got turned up on my face i was like that's so smart because what you're saying is you're, you're like you said you're, you're kind of giving your, your younger self advice about how to succeed and how to move forward inevitably the people that fall some of the people that follow you are in the same position as your younger self right and they're going to benefit from that and so speaking of benefit, let me ask, so, so one, one or two more questions and then, and then we'll wrap this up. Um, what, um, so what is the benefit of building that platform? So six months on Twitter, you're doing great. Obviously LinkedIn um, is, is very successful for you. YouTube videos, right? Why, like what, what are the benefits that you have seen building out that platform, from building out that platform? The biggest benefit has been the ability to help people outside of Memphis. Because before my limitations were, this is Memphis, these are the people in my community, these are the only people that I could possibly help. Now I get messages daily where people are telling me, I finally got that job because you gave me these great interview tips, or I finally got that job because you helped me pinpoint the area that I needed to be in. Or for example, I, re I released a LinkedIn course on YouTube that LinkedIn course, I just released it and it's completely free. You know, I don't want to monetize this thing, but that LinkedIn course alone, I've literally in like one week, I'm getting screenshots of people saying my views have increased by 750%. In one week, I've been contacted by 18 employers. And like, and what kills me about this is this literally proves to me what I know these developers have the qualifications. These developers know exactly what they need to do the job, but they can't stop opportunity from literally walking right by them. Like, think about that for a second. 
Opportunity is in front of your nose, walking by, and you don't have an ability to stop it. So now my goal is to basically put your hand right in front of it to stop it right in front of you and act, produce that situation where you can actually get that job that you're qualified for. And it's working. And, and I mean, this is a very short turnaround time. Mind you, I released that course like three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and people have already gotten yeah. jobs out of it. So that to me is a huge thing. But the other thing is, uh, especially with Twitter, the reason why I'm on Twitter so much, I realized there are many people that start learning how to program every single day. I don't care what you know, how beginner of a level that you think you are. Someone starts learning HTML every single day of the week. You know something now that someone else doesn't know. So it is a perfect opportunity for you to share whatever knowledge you have at this current time to help someone that may be struggling. Don't you know people look for the most simplest things on the internet every single day? So why wouldn't you want to share your gift with the world? You know something that can help literally one person anywhere. And now it's gone from I'm helping people in Memphis, Tennessee to where I have, I'm helping people in Lagos, Nigeria. I'm helping people in India. I'm helping people in uh, Sydney, Australia. I'm helping people in Russia. Like your reach goes global at that point. And it doesn't matter if one person reads it or 10,000 people read it. That impact is the same. You're affecting one life positively. Why would you want to turn down that opportunity? It doesn't matter if you become an influencer or whatever they call these positions now. What matters is that you're conveying a message that actually affects a life. And you Amazing. can do that positively or you can do that negatively. It's up to you. Sure. Sure. And listen, and, and, and I'm, I'm going to just double down on one of, one of the ideas that you just said. I mean, everything's, everything's worth doubling down on, but I'm, I'm going to highlight one thing. It's, it's, again, one of the biggest obstacles for folks is what do I know? What am I an expert at? What could I possibly share? And to your point, there's always, always, always an audience for 101 level content, ent entry level content. Somebody is starting today and you can help them out. Let me ask you, let me ask you one Not more even question. that. I just want right. uh, to, I just want to touch on this. It doesn't even matter if it's 101 content. Like there are geniuses that follow geniuses. There are people that I consider like there are people that I know that work at like Microsoft and Google and these amazing companies that are following developers for inspiration that work at lower level companies. It doesn't matter what you're bringing to the table. The only thing that really matters is you stay very true to your real self. Do not create this fictitious item that doesn't exist. And I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. A lot of people try to portray something that they're not online and eventually it becomes not you, but it becomes a task or it's impossible to keep creating content on this idea that you aren't like you're trying to embody something that you are not. So what happens with these people is they end up falling apart with a couple months down the road and they lose everything. Be you because I know that you're amazing. You know that you're amazing. Now it is up to you to convey that through a tweet, through a post, and you have to keep that consistency because consistent action produces consistent results. Once you stop and break that, that is when everything falls apart. So you can't go like, hey, I'm a developer today, but tomorrow I'm a painter. Like it's, yep. it, you, you gotta keep things flowing the right way. And if you do that, you'll grow. Amazing. All right, man, last question. And I'm super curious about this one. So uh, we're living in strange times. The, uh, the pandemic has radically changed the world, you know, and, and no telling when we go back to normal or what the new normal will ultimately end up being. Um, how has the, the pandemic impacted your work and your career positively, negatively, neutrally? What, what, what kind of impact have you seen from the way that we're sort of engaging in, and working now? I mean, for my career in particular, you know, I've gotten a raise during this pandemic. My job growth is growing. Uh, so it, it's not hurting me, but I will say it's hurt, definitely hurting the, the community somewhat because it is harder for someone to get an entry level position now because 30 million Americans lost their jobs in this pandemic, right? So you have senior developers that are desperate for work to the point to where they're applying for lower level positions just to get a paycheck on the table. 
So just keeping that in mind, I'm not going to say it's impossible to land something. It's absolutely not impossible. Just last, what, two weeks ago, I helped one person land a job. But I am going to say that it's definitely not as easy as it was before. With that also being said, because of this pandemic, it's almost been a blessing in disguise to certain areas because bef- before this, I don't know if you and I would be having this conversation the way we are right now. Mm-hmm. I can on- honestly tell you I, last month I've spoke at 14 different events. I don't know if I would have been able to pull that off unless it was for this, because before this no one utilized zoom the way we're utilizing it. Now that wasn't a thing. Uh, it, not even just zoom, but any online event because I was doing events before And I did one event with a speaker from Brazil and we did a video conference call and that was so hard to actually pull off and people were not as interested in it because it's like, oh, it's a foreign speaker. They're not there. They can't answer questions one-on-one. We did a great job. This was in January, I believe, or December before COVID was a thing. Yeah. So at that timetable, it was hard to pull this off. Now I just had an event where we had 500 people from all over the world pop in where we had speakers from Google and et cetera, et cetera. So people from there were never coming to Memphis before. Like I wasn't getting them here to speak at events, but now it's opened up the playing field completely. And I totally see this being different now in the future. Like I don't foresee myself doing an in-person event before 2021 anytime soon. Like that's definitely not on the table. But yeah, I mean, this makes it so much easier to plan things. Logistically, I, I did a conference. I did the first tech conference that Memphis ever had. And I remember I approached like 20 people. This was like at the beginning of the pandemic. I approached like 20 people like, hey, I really have this goal. I've always had this goal. I want to give a tech conference in Memphis. I want to do it big. And they were all like, no, there's no way. It's going to fail. It's not going to do good. It's going to fall apart. Like this isn't going to happen. I was gutted like these are people that are experts in this area of organizing these events and they're all telling me like this is not going to happen i was gutted it was like two almost three weeks later one person finally came back and was like you know what if you really want to do this if you really want to do it i'll go ahead and i'll donate my time to this thing and i just looked at him i said oh did you guys think i wasn't going to do this you think this this was going to stop? No, no, no. I've already got the speakers planned out. I've got the software for it. I've got the tickets already sold. Like, this is done. And we ended up having over 3,000 people attend the conference. And mm-hmm. it was all virtual. And the one thing I realized after I was gutted and was, like, hurt and was thinking, like, man, this isn't going to happen, I said, oh, I don't have to worry about the logistics of getting people here. I don't have to worry about people having to travel to Memphis for this anymore. I'm going to put this entire thing online. And we'll just get people to come. And we had 3,000 people show up. Amazing. So even if someone is like, you know, doubting what you can do, or for example, like the logistics of a pandemic make things a little bit more difficult, it is absolutely feasible and possible to make whatever you want to happen, happen. Yeah. And look, and that's, and that's your entrepreneurial spirit shining through there in that dedication. And that's amazing. Uh, amazing to hear. Danny, um, really, thank you so much for sharing your amazing story. I'm super motivated and, and energized by it. And I, I feel like there's a thousand more things I should be doing right now. So thank you for inspiring me as well. I appreciate you taking the time. And uh, I look forward to observing your success uh, continue to grow. Thank you. And I, I, I'm very grateful for you having me here. And I hope that there are a few people that watch this that will end up becoming forever employable. Like the opportunity is there and I hope they take advantage of it. Me too. Thanks so much. Thank you.